This is part 8 in our series of lectures on section 4.3. In this lecture we're going to talk about bijections and inverses. If f is a function from set A to set B, then it's always the case that f inverse exists as a relation. As a relation, it's defined to be the set of all ordered pairs yx in B cross A such that xy is an element of f, and since f is a function, that's the same thing as saying the set of yx in b cross a, such that y is equal to f of x. But if we impose the right condition on f, then f inverse is actually a function from b to a, and the following theorem tells us precisely when that happens. The theorem says that if f is a function from set a to set b, then f inverse is actually a function from b to a, if and only if f is a bijection. So the main thing that we're going to do in this lecture is that we're going to write a proof of this theorem. The theorem is a biconditional statement. It says that if f inverse is a function from b into a, then it must be the case that f is a bijection. And it also says that conversely, if f is a bijection, then f inverse must be a function from b into a. So let's begin by proving the forward direction. Assuming that f inverse is a function from b into a, then f is a bijection. So here's the proof of the part of the forward direction. We suppose that f inverse is a function from b into a, and we have to prove that f is a bijection. In other words, we have to prove that f is injective and surjective. On this slide, I give the proof that f is surjective. And I'm going to make use of a fact or a theorem that we proved in an earlier lecture, um, that when f inverse is a function from b into a, then f inverse composed with f is equal to the identity on b. In other words, the function that maps every element of b to itself. So now I'm going to show you how to use that to prove that f is surjective. To prove that f is surjective, we give ourselves an element of the target space B, the codomain of F, and we have to show how to choose an X such that F maps that X over to Y. So here's how I'm going to choose it. I choose X to be F inverse of Y. I can do that because F inverse is assumed to be a function and so F inverse of Y is just a single element. So now I just have to prove that F of X is equal to Y. So what I do is I I use this and I use this as follows. Y is equal to the identity of, on B evaluated at Y. Of course that's just the definition of the identity. But now I use the fact that the identity is F inverse composed with F. But that's the same as uh, evaluating that at Y is the same as F of F inverse of Y. And now if you look back here and you take f of both sides, that says f of x is equal to f of f inverse of y, and that's what I've written here. Okay, so I was given a y and b. I chose x to be this thing here, and I showed that f of x is equal to y. That's the proof that f is surjective. On this slide, I'm going to show you how to prove that f is injective, and once again we're going to use the other half of that result in section 4.2 that says that when f inverse is a function, then it follows that f composed with f inverse is the identity on A. So now we just go back to the working definition of what it would mean to say that f is injective. So to prove it, we give ourselves two elements of our domain. We assume that the f values at those two points are the same, and then we have to prove that x1 equals x2. So I'm going to use this here, and I'm going to use this as follows. x sub 1 is equal to the identity on A evaluated at x sub 1, but the identity on A is equal to f composed with f inverse, that's this fact here, and the value of this function at x1 is just f inverse of f of x1. So now we notice that if we take f inverse of both sides of this, we get 
that this is equal to this. And now we reverse the argument that we've just given. This is, is the same as the composition, f composed with f inverse evaluated at x2, uh, but f composed with f inverse is equal to the identity on a, again, by this fact here, and the identity on a at x2 is equal to x2. So I've proved that x1 equals x2. So that proves that f is injective. I gave myself a pair of points in a. I assumed that the f values were the same, and I deduced that the x values were the same. That's what it means to say that f is injective. So we've now proved f is injective and surjective, and so that completes the proof that f is a bijection. Now the other half of the proof asserts that if f is a bijection, then f inverse is a function from b into a. And so that's what we're going to do next. We assume that f is a bijection, and we have to prove that f inverse is a function from b into a. So what is the working definition of the statement that f inverse is a function from b to a? It takes two things. It must be the case that the domain of f inverse is all of b, and it must be the case that Given any point in that domain, if you give yourself two points of the target space, x1 and x2, and if yx1 and yx2 are both elements of the, of the um, thing that we want to prove as a function, f inverse, then x1 equals x2. In other words, given a first element y, there can be only one image of that. Okay, so in order to prove one, we're just going to work with the um, definitions directly. The domain of f inverse is defined to be the set of all y in the initial set b, such that there exists an x in the target set a, such that y comma x is an element of f inverse. That is the working definition of the domain of f inverse. But by definition, y x is in f inverse, if and only if x, y is in f. That's the definition of f inverse. But f is a function, and so to say that x, y is an element of f is the same as saying y is equal to f of x. So the domain of f inverse is the set of y and b such that there exists an x in a such that y is equal to f of x. But since f is surjective, we know that Given any y in b, there always exists an x in a such that y is f of x. That's the working definition of what it means to say that f is surjective. And remember, that's our assumption here. We're assuming that f is a bijection. And therefore, um, that's true for all y in b, and therefore this set here is all of b. So that's where we've made use of the fact that f is surjective in the proof. Now, in order to prove this other one, as you'll see, we're going to have to make use of the fact that f is injective. So, re just read it from left to right and see if you can write a proof. Let y be an element of b, and let x1 and x2 be elements of a. Suppose yx1 and yx2 are elements of f inverse. So that's how I started my proof. Well, to say that yx1 and yx2 are elements of f inverse is to say that if you reverse the order, that you get elements of f. And that's the same as saying that f of x1 um, is y and f of x2 is y. In other words, f of x1 must equal f of x2. But now you see we can make use of the fact that f is injective to deduce that x1 must equal x2. And that's what we needed to prove, right? We needed to deduce that x1 is equal to x2. So we've uh, verified that 1 and 2 are true, and therefore, by definition, f inverse is a function from b into a, and that completes the proof. As a corollary to this theorem, we have the following. Uh, if we let a and b be sets, and f a function from a to b, then the theorem asserts that if f is a bijection, then f inverse is also a bijection. Well, according to the theorem, the fact that f is a bijection says that f inverse is a function from b to a, right? That was the content, that was half of the content of the previous theorem. So we know f inverse is a function. So once again, if we recall that result we proved um, in one of the lectures of section 4.2, uh, 
Um, the fact that f inverse is a function from b to a says the following two things. When you compose f inverse, f inverse composed with f is the identity on b, and f composed with f inverse is the identity on a. So I'm going to now leave the uh, proof of the corollary to you as an exercise, and it's a good exercise in making use of working definitions and in making use of these two facts. So see if you can write up a proof of this thing, um, and we'll probably revisit it either on a um, homework assignment or um, a class activity. But I would like to say one last thing, that the result of this the result in this corollary and the result in the theorem is really worth remembering. So you should um, know the result, you should know how to state it, because we're going to make use of both of those results in um, the next chapter when we talk about cardinality of sets.